Is part of the appeal of the irrational that there's a kind of mistrust of science and scientists? And what are we going to do about that, if so? I think everything we've spoken about is symptomatic of a wider malaise. Uh, distrust of experts. Um, for the philosophically minded amongst your viewers, it's the rise of postmodern relativism. Uh, I happen to share one view of humanity and health and treatment, but that's my opinion. Uh, someone, else see, el someone else has studied uh, metaphysical textbooks about uh, the body and its working and health, and they have a different opinion to mine, and their opinion is of equal value to my opinion. And that's what we mean by postmodern relativism. Along with this, there's uh, the um, increasing distrust of experts. Uh, it, it's, it's curious to me that we'll have alternative uh, medical practitioners and we, we'll also have alternative legal advocates, if you like, and alternative teaching theories. We haven't yet come up with an alternative Boeing 747 pilot, <laughs> uh, although I'm sure there are people out there who think they can fly a Boeing 747 equally well, if only they were given the chance. But th th we joke, but th th these are really, really serious issues. And um, a knock-on effect of that is the MMR uh, uh, crisis, uh, failure of immunizing the, the population, because people, naive people, chose to believe there was a conspiracy of the medical establishment and the government, uh, a conspiracy by which, in order to protect the herd, they were willing to sacrifice countless children to autism. And this is simply a lie. There ain't no conspiracy. There is nothing in this. It is a lie. And yet I know for a fact that the children of my close friends, when we talk about this over dinner parties, they're not immunizing their children. So many of the grandchildren of my generation are not being protected. And then the other big scandal, there are many young women backpacking around the world who are taking homeopathic antimalarials and coming back to this country with malaria. That's shocking. We've talked a lot about homeopathy, but of course there are quite a lot of other types of therapy which are called either complementary or alternative. Uh, which ones do you have time for and which ones don't you? Well, um, let me just at random, they're countless, uh, come up with two. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of time for art therapy as complementary therapy. It's a, a way of allowing patients to express their deepest feelings, uh, provide a catharsis for them. And I think it's wonderful, but I won't bore you with that. Uh, it's a special prejudice of mine. Uh, one that is very interesting, because it can be considered alternative or complementary, is acupuncture. Now, acupuncture to me is alternative when it's a comprehensive belief system uh, in metaphysical fluxes along meridians of yings and yangs and so on and uh, <laughs> explains and treats all disease. That's alternative. But acupuncture is actually quite useful as a complementary therapy for certain types of pain. There are many uh, excellent anaesthetists who use it in pain clinics. Uh, and as it turns out, um, there are physiological mechanisms that will explain why it works, the release of endorphins uh, by needle puncture, and there have been many clinical trials. But I just want to tell you one anecdote which illustrates the importance of clinical trials. I promise you this is true, it sounds utterly implausible, but two years ago I chaired a meeting in Florence um, on the role of complementary and alternative medicine in breast cancer. It was a tough meeting to chair because I had representatives of uh, scientific medicine, complementary uh, alternative. We're trying to reach um, a commonality, a uh, rapprochement of sorts. Up and leading up to that meeting, I had the most exquisite sacroiliac pain, terrible sacroiliac pain. I was limping. And the first night, uh, when we sat down to dinner, the, at the end of the first day, sitting next to me was a lovely lady who was a, an acupuncturist. And she offered me acupuncture because she saw I was in pain. And the next day, 
I was free of pain, and the next afternoon I spent two hours walking around the Uffizi Gallery. Now, the interesting thing there is she offered it, but I didn't accept it. <laughs> Had I accepted it, I would have been a convert. Yeah. That anecdote would have been so powerful. I would have become a believer, me the great skeptic. So it's scary in that the anecdote would have persuaded me, but it, because the anecdote goes the other way, but most important, emphasizes the needs of controlled trials. Yes. I mean, my, my job is to promote the public understanding of science, and I'm increasingly realizing during this television um, program that it's so important to try to get across to people the dangers of fooling themselves, the, dang the dangers of being kidded by, um, by anecdotes of that kind. Personal experiences are so incredibly powerful. And you have to find some way of separating yourself from that kind of personal experience and go back to the evidence. And that's a very, very hard uh, lesson for any of us to learn. Yeah. You've diagnosed a sort of irrational malaise afflicting us today and mm. I wonder whether perhaps it's a kind of self-indulgent luxury that's become possible because we do live in such cushy surroundings. I could imagine that if one lived in a sort of world where the only doctor available was the witch doctor, uh, you might, uh, and, and there really was real danger of, of, of death from all sorts of illnesses all the time, one would positively r reach like a heart for cooling streams for a rational doctor or rational science. Mm. I absolutely agree. We are spoiled. We are self-indulgent. Uh, we take risks with our lives because uh, we think we've become uh, immortal. And at the same time, the very people who promote alternative medicine deny progress. Uh, a lot of this uh, natural remedies, natural healing, uh, hark back to a belief in a golden age. And I have to constantly remind people, this is the golden age, yes. and the next age will be more golden, providing we continue our scientific quest. There never was a golden age in the past. If you look back to Victorian England, the vast majority of people, expectation of life was 40, 30% infant mortality. Now our expectation of life is close to 80. In fact, it's become a problem. As, uh, for uh, We're now going to have to work longer because we are dying older. Children, the vast majority of children are surviving childbirth and uh, there never has been such a golden age, and, and yet the lay public uh, are in danger of throwing this all away, and that again is, is just heartbreaking.